Okay, so we see some of the attendees rolling in. Hello, everyone. Welcome. It's really nice to see so many repeat attendees. Represented us from Wake Forest. Cherokee Nation. Oh yeah, there's Jack Baker. Mm -hmm. Special welcome to Dr. Curtin Roberts, who was with us tonight, last night, and Dr. Fowl, who will be with us very soon as a keynote. So welcome to our Saturday conference uh, session. We will would like to welcome everyone here and uh, introduce uh, the conveners. My name is Grant McAllister. I am an associate professor and Levison faculty fellow in the Department of German and Russian at Wake Forest University. I am one of the three co-conveners for this conference. Welcome to today's uh, uh, first session for the morning and uh, and uh, we're very happy to have you with us. Mm -hmm. Good morning. My name is Ulrike Wiethaus. I'm professor in the Department for the Study of Religions at Wake Forest University, and I'm one of the three co-conveners. I would like our, to begin our time this morning with a land acknowledgement statement from our university. The conference recognizes and respects the indigenous peoples of our region as a traditional stewards of this land. Our conference acknowledges the enduring relationship that exists between indigenous peoples and their traditional territories. The land on which Wake Forest University now resides and the land on which the original campus resided has served and continues to serve as a place for exchange and interaction for indigenous peoples specifically in the past, the Sora, and in the past and today, the Kataba, Cherokee, and Lambi nations in the current location, and historically, the Shakori, Eno, Sisipaho, and Okanichi peoples in the original campus location. I welcome you to another full day of good conversations and a town and town relationship. My name is Eric Elliott. I'm the archivist here at the Moravian Archives in Winston-Salem. We welcome you again to what's been a, a wonderful four days of interchange and information and um, connection, uh, well with our past, our present, and I hope good things for our future. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I'd now like to introduce Phil Archer. He is the Betsy Maine Babcock Director of Program and Inter Interpretation at the Renolda House Museum of American Art. Originally, our conference was going to be held at the Renolda House on this final day. Um, and uh, if you can see Phil there, uh, there is a virtual background of the Renolda House. So we are still bringing the Renolda House to you, although virtually. Um, he is going to offer a couple of uh, opening remarks about the Renolda Conference and um, welcome you here to our conference. So go ahead, Phil. Thank you, Grant, and good morning, everyone. It's an honor to join the co-conveners to welcome you to the third day of the Becoming American Conference. Um, as Grant mentioned, you've heard this referred to as a Renolda Conference. What's the story there? 
This name harkens back to a series of events held in the 1920s in the reception hall of Rinalda that's pictured behind me. Long before this room displayed the landscapes by Cole and Church and Albert Bierstadt, which Alison Slaby shared with you yesterday, this room hosted interdisciplinary encounters of visiting scholars invited from across the country to debate, and it was hoped reconcile branches of academic inquiry. The first of these syncretic gatherings tried to cut no less a Gordian knot than reconciling Christian dogma with the theory of evolution. This was 1924, one year prior to the Scopes trial, and the teaching of evolution was illegal in many parts of the nation. It's notable that this conference embraced the theory and some of the proceedings were even published at the time. This zeal for rigorous intellectual engagement across disciplines continues in the present conference. And I've deeply enjoyed seeing a community of interest develop over the past um, couple of days among all the participants in this conference. As dispersed as we are, neighborliness without nearness is one thing we have learned, fortunately. And this conference has, I think, an especially neighborly spirit. Um, speaking of neighbors, Ulrika Vitaus asked me to share a bit about historic ties between Rinalda and Salem. The fact is, there would be no Rinalda and therefore no Wake Forest campus in Winston-Salem without the town and especially the schools of Salem. It may seem surprising in retrospect that R.J. Reynolds, a Virginia native, should have selected the tiny hamlet of Winston, North Carolina, population 443 souls, to locate his tobacco company and eventual, eventually empire. His decision was based on three factors, not Moravian stars, thin spice cookies, or sugar, sugar cake, as far as we know, but rather the soil that was propitious for bright leaf tobacco, um, proximity to rail lines that could, could lead his product out to major markets, and thirdly, the Moravians next door in Salem who had established a strong tradition of progressive education. Three of R.J. Reynolds' sisters and several cousins had attended the Salem Academy, and he admired the industriousness and the commitment to education that he witnessed when visiting them. By the time of Reynolds' death in 1918, Winston-Salem was the state's largest city, and the industry, capital, family trees had all intertwined between Moravian and non-Moravian. Uh, as the textile and tobacco boomtown expanded and eventually merged. The Reynolds's eldest child, R.J. Reynolds Jr., attended the boys' school at Salem uh, for just one year before um, contracting measles, but he must have formed a few happy memories in that brief time because in 1941, he purchased the Salem Tavern, which Martha Hartley showed us yesterday on her virtual tour, and he donated it to the Wachovia Historical Society for restoration. Around that same time, his sister, Mary Reynolds Babcock, and her husband, Charles Babcock, took a similar interest in restoring Salem into, quote, another Williamsburg. And they commissioned an architectural survey of the town, which guided the work of a planning committee. Mary Reynolds Babcock died in 1953, but her husband, Charles, carried on the preservation work without her. Old Salem's founding president, James Gray, named Babcock as the person primarily responsible for Salem becoming a museum of Moravian history and culture open to the public, Salem reborn as Old Salem. There is every indication that the Reynolds heirs recognized that the tobacco company would not have taken hold or taken off without the support of the Moravian citizenry. And they demonstrated their indebtedness through historic preservation. Preservation is of course one ingredient of a community's awareness and appreciation of its history. With programs like this week's conference, community learning is deepened through confronting and understanding the past with greater nuance and complexity, including the legacy of crimes against humanity. These fresh re-examinations provide a necessary and healthy counterbalance and extension to his historic preservation. I'm very grateful to our co-conveners, Ulrika Vitaus, Grant McAllister, and Eric Elliott for all their planning, stage managing. Ulrika even has her head, stage manager head this morning, uh, and their generous hospitality. 
uh, we felt very well cared for. Thanks also to our friends at the Humanities Institute, mm -hmm. Dean Franco, Amy Mepham, and Victoria Lang for their vision and support of the conference uh, from the outset. Thanks finally to the scholars whose most recent research and insights we'll have the privilege of hearing shortly. I'm so glad to be with you all. Thank you. And on behalf of Rinalda, welcome. Thank you so much. Grant, uh, you are muted. Huh. Thank you. I think I've got it now. Um, let's see if someone was trying to share a, a screen there. Um, so I'd like to welcome everyone to our conference and talk a little bit about the title. The title of our conference is Becoming American, Moravians and Their Neighbors, 1772 through 1822. I would like to do this to begin our final day of proceedings. And I'd like to start with a quotation that directly engages the first part of our conference title, namely that of becoming an American. Quote, it was finally decided to sail and about 10 o'clock the anchor was lifted while we prayed earnestly that it might not be dropped again until we were safe in a harbor in our fatherland, end quote. The statement is from Ludwig David von Schweinitz in the year 1812. The word fatherland might not initially seem that unusual. However, it belies a critical shift in attitudes about national identity taking root in Salem Moravian culture. The word fatherland does not appear in the Wachovia diaries until this statement in 1812. Initially, Moravians profess no loyalty to any king, region, or state. According to Gisela Metzela, Moravians, quote, saw themselves as part of a worldwide community, or Reiches Gottes, an empire of God. But in Salem in 1812, that changed. We would like to know why. The other half of our conference title suggests that the answer lies in the figure of the neighbor, itself a complex signifier implying both kindness and competition, dominance, and subjugation. In cultivating their existence, Moravians scored the land with plows and palisades and demarcated a neighborhood of inclusion and exclusion, both physically and conceptually. Understanding how an ethically fraught interplay of cultures within this space led to a proclamation of national identity is the challenge that inaugurated our comp and the subsequent discussions therein. We have asked Philip John Sensbach to join us today to summarize our thoughts and to present to you a window into our morning discussions and del deliberations about this problem. So without further delay, I'd like to uh, introduce to you John Sensbach, and he will then provide a summary of our morning deliberations. John Sensbach is a professor in the Department of History at the University of Florida. He received his PhD in 1991 in early American history from Duke University. He teaches courses on early America, the Black Atlantic, the Atlantic slave trade, colonial America, and the American Revolution, among several others. I just kind of picked the, uh, from the list, large list that he has. Professor Sensbach has been an NEH fellow at the National Humanities Center and an NEH postdoctoral fellow at the Omohonduro Institute, Duro Institute for Early American History and Culture. His most recent book is Rebecca's Revival, Creating Black Christianity in the Atlantic World. He is also the author of A Separate Canaan, The Making of an Afro-Moravian World in North Carolina. And I think many here in this region are very familiar with that work. He is also the co-author of The New History of the American South, forthcoming from UNC Press. And he's an author of many other uh, books and uh, articles. So without uh, further ado, uh, welcome, John. Thanks very much. Okay, all right, sorry, I'm gonna have to, as feared, I'm gonna have to open my, my other screen. Sorry if this means I'm going to break up, but I have to do it. Well, first of all, uh, thank you for, for that introduction, and thank you for, uh, to, to the conveners, first of all, for hosting this uh, conference 
um, for conceptualizing it and, uh, and, and for uh, moving so adroitly in these perilous times to this different format. And uh, you've managed it very well indeed, and, and everything has come off uh, extremely smoothly. Um, thank you for the invitation to take part. Um, what, what I'm going to do is to offer some general conceptual ideas uh, that we can, that can help perhaps frame our discussion. And then I'm going to very briefly summarize each of the papers that we've listened to over the past couple of days. And I'll pose some questions uh, to the presenters and then we can open it up to whatever format the discussion will, will take. Um, I, I, would, I would start by observing that, that the, the Moravian story that we've been talking about is a, first and foremost a story of immigration. And, and I'm reminded of, uh, of the, the, the very influential book, very famous book by Oscar Hamlin many years ago uh, called The Uprooted, very influential book. And Hamlin famously begins that book by saying, once I thought to write a history of the immigrants in America. Then I discovered that the immigrants were American history. And Hamlin's book offers uh, up a, a, a series of very influential tropes and themes that have shaped the discussion of immigration. Themes of uprootedness, uh, themes of leaving one's homeland, of escaping oppression and poverty, uh, to come to a strange country where you might not speak the language, uh, where you encounter unfamiliar life ways, uh, you get homesick for the old country, uh, the search for economic security in this new place. All of that gives way, according to, to Hamlin's formulation, uh, and, and as it's since been identified, is um, uh, this sort of gives way to this mysterious process of Americanization, of learning English, of adapting to new customs and expectations, of the tensions between the traditional and the new, uh, between loss and gain, between sacrifice and fulfillment, especially for one's children and grandchildren. There's a generational dimension here that Americanization in this process is, is not quick. It's, it doesn't happen overnight, but it can spin out over several generations. The story of immigration, therefore, in immigration history that is preceded from these assumptions is generally one of progress, of assimilation and transformation, of the untethering of the self, in a new world of freedom and possibility, the gradual letting go of old ways to embrace the better life and democratic ethos of this new place called America. What is this American, this new man, famously asked Hector Saint-Jean de Crèvecoeur in 1787. He is an American who, leaving behind him all his ancient prejudices and manners, receives new ones from the new life he has embraced, the new government he obeys, and the new rank he holds. He becomes an American by being received into the broad lap of our alma mater. This formulation has had enduring resonance throughout American history. It still has enormous allure, uh, a kind of a mystical, almost primal attraction for the way we think about ourselves as Americans, we still think of ourselves as, as a nation of immigrants, as it's commonly formulated, even in our own time when immigration uh, remains a, a divisive and explosive uh, political issue. In recent years, scholars have, of course, challenged this version of, of immigration history and recognized the limitations to it. Uh, how, how do we account for the presence of the original Americans, indigenous Americans, unless we consider them the original immigrants 25,000 years ago. Um, how does their story play out in this nation of immigrants? Uh, what about the story of enslaved Africans, uh, those who were forced against their will to emigrate to America um, and, and do not, did not initially enjoy for hundreds of years the, the supposed fruits and benefits of, of this new melting pot, this new creation called America? Both of these themes obviously are central to this conference and to the papers that, that, that we've heard and we'll continue discussing. Still, uh, many features of the Moravian story are recognizable from this basic outline. Here we have a, a group of German settlers, mostly German settlers, uh, trying to maintain what was distinctive about their culture and their religion. Uh, the older generation casting themselves as defenders of tradition anxiously trying to fend off the appeal of American freedoms. Uh, 
the younger generations constantly chafing against regulations, pushing against the boundaries to expand their ability to think and act for themselves. As this struggle played out for much of the 18th century and into the 19th, there's broad consensus among scholars that it was, a, it was powerfully shaped by the American Revolution and the creation of the United States, that it involved a gradual shift toward participation in public life in the political process, a transition from a communal ethos to individualism, from the German language to English, and from a sacred, sacred to a secular outlook. The net result of all this is that the Moravians became more like their Anglophone non-Moravian neighbors increasingly in the 19th century, less distinctive, less German, more American. Another feature of the Moravian story that's recognizable in more recent scholarship is the connection between immigration and racial formation. We can see this in the titles of recent books published about the immigration experience. Uh, How the Irish Became White is one title. How Jews Became White Folks is another. Working Toward Whiteness, How America's Immigrants Became White. These titles reflect a common theme of immigrant outsiders who are coded as racially ambiguous and suspect, who, in order to fit in to American society once they get here, embrace the racist practices that they have found to establish themselves as white. The Moravians fit that pattern as well. They initially accept blacks into fellowship. They're rumored to harbor runaway slaves. Their loyalty in the American Revolution is suspect. And so to affirm their status as white citizens in the new republic, they begin erecting physical and emotional barriers between themselves and the black brothers and sisters they once shared church benches with. And so these conference papers explore how all these changes can be charted through Moravian material culture, religious practice, music, racial mores, archival keeping, history writing, by the presence of slavery and enslaved people in the community and as part of the community, and by Moravian connections to indigenous Americans, specifically the Cherokees in this instance. The overarching theme, as I see it, that emerges, emerges from all of this work is, as we'll see, is that there were more, there were competing and overlapping versions of what it meant to be American. There was no consensus then, nor is there now, about what an American identity is or was, either among the Moravians or in the nation at large. Did it mean allegiance to a nation state? Did it mean a shared culture and history? And if so, what were though that culture and history? Is being American equivalent to citizenship in the United States. And if nationalism is an imagined community, as Benedict Anderson calls it, whose imagination called the American community into being and how did Moravians respond to that? So we had four different research sessions, each with several papers in them. I'm going to very quickly summarize each of these papers and, and then ask a question to, to, to kind of uh, encapsulate what I see as the themes in each of these panels. The first session that we had on Thursday morning was called Arts, Architecture, and Culture. Uh, and this was a panel about uh, adaptability um, in Moravian material culture and music that reflected a gradual acculturation to what the presenters uh, uh, consider a broad theme of Americanization. Uh, David Bergstone, uh, re reflected on architectural changes from traditional European building forms to American national styles. Um, and this re is reflected in the architectural legacy, particularly in Old Salem. Um, we see by the turn of the 19th century, larger single family homes in the federal style by 1800, 1810, um, uh, a, a turn away from sort of the smaller uh, European styles that, that had prevailed um, in the early years of Salem's creation. Um, and, and this shift, Bergstone argues, um, reflected a turn away from communalism toward privatization and individualism, toward the accumulation of greater wealth and individual agency, as reflected in uh, very spacious uh, homes in Old Salem, particularly the Beerling House and the John Vogler House, 
uh, to, to cite two prominent examples. So these architectural shifts, uh, Bergston argues, represented a, a turn away from certain aspects that had marked the Moravians uh, as, as, as a kind of communally oriented people uh, when they first settled. Uh, David Bloom um, explores the collections of the Moravian Music Foundation to tell a story of musical choices that reflected gradual shifts away from uh, German and sacred music to secular tastes during the so-called golden age of, Amer of Moravian music between 1750 and 1830. Uh, he argues that sacred music itself was never abandoned, but that diverse selections from Beethoven to the Star Spangled Banner and other diverse American compositions so a gradual Americanization of musical tastes. Uh, similarly, Stuart Carter uh, examined early performances of Franz Josef Haydn's The Creation in Salem in the early 19th century. Uh, he argues that this famous piece of music was, was performed for the first time in, a, in, in, the, in the American South in Salem in 1829. And this performance uh, shows a gradual acceptance of non-sacred orchestral music in the community. Uh, musical choices reflected tension between the church authorities and the Collegium Musicum, the musical, the town musical authority, over growing secularization. But these performances represented what he calls a watershed in the musical life of Salem. And then finally, Jeff Hughes uh, examines uh, ceramic styles in the late 18th century and early 19th century. Uh, he asks, in what ways did Americanism become acceptably Moravian? And he explores this dichotomy uh, through ceramic styles. He argues that the assimilation of English ceramic styles into and alongside German styles by well-known Moravian potters such as Rudolf Christ uh, represented a turn from traditional Germanic coarse earthenware to more refined stoneware valued by non-Moravians in the region. And this adaptation uh, shows a willingness to change for practical reasons and therefore a shift toward Americanization. We see in these papers the synthesis of styles and tastes in material culture and music that present evidence of a gradual shift toward, toward Americanization, but they also blur the lines between what was German, American, and Moravian and between the sacred and secular, making it difficult to distinguish what was what. And in this mysterious process of Americanization, uh, how do we know what, what, what is what? Is it the process of adaptation itself that is American? And does that reflect a, a synthesis of willingness to accept um, uh, whole melding of ideas from all kinds of different influences? So therefore, my, my question would be for this group, did changes in architecture, music, and ceramics represent a conscious set of choices to embrace Americanization? And if so, what did becoming American mean to those who made those choices as reflected in the material culture musical sensibilities? Um, by the way, I'm, 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 I'm reminded of the uh, magnificent um, recent article by Rachel Wheeler and Sarah Eyerly um, who reconstruct Mohican Moravian 18th century hymns uh, and, 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 and the fact that this represents a different kind of Americanization in a different context by, by indigenous Americans. But the fusion of musical cultures uh, it represents uh, this kind of adaptation, this kind of reformulation by, by a different group of, 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 of Americans. Um, and, and we might see a similar kind of thing in a different context in, in the, the North Carolina uh, Moravian um, settlement. Uh, session two uh, was called Religion, Gender, and Economics. And this, this panel reflected broadly on, on the way uh, religious changes, economic and gender changes in the, in the late 18th, early 19th century reflected this broader pattern of what they see as Americanization. Uh, Craig Atwood, uh, grounds our understanding of the Wachovia settlement in the original vision of Count Zinzendorf and August Schwangenberg, uh, namely an apostolic utopian settlement, a so-called city on the hill, as Spangenberg called it, where individual free will was sublimated to the demands of the community, where Moravians could practice their faith free of outside influence, and yet survive by establishing economic relationships 
with those same non-Moravian outsiders. Within just a few years of the founding of Bethabara, Bethania, and Salem, uh, this vision collided headlong with the American Revolution, which generated massive social changes that by 1820, Atwood argues, meant that the North Carolina settlement had become more American than Moravian. Grant McAllister examines the famous Moravian Easter sunrise service that evolved between the late 18th and the 19th, early, uh, early 19th century from a small community gathering to a large public event open to throngs of non-Moravians. So many, so many non-Moravians attended that in fact some years the Moravians themselves had to and to simply abandon this as, as in, in their, their original vision for it. Uh, this practice meant that the litany changed from German to English, reflecting a growing Americanization of the Salem congregation. Uh, he argues that the growing presence of the female boarding school in Salem, which drew non-Moravian students from a broader region, was influential in this shift. And it also reflected growing racial segregation within the Moravian community that African-American worshipers who would have wanted to attend the Easter sunrise service were held apart uh, and segregated away from it. Uh, they were in this process of being defined as emotional and physical others, this separation that we begin to see in the early 19th century. Uh, Jake Ruddiman uh, traces uh, Moravian storekeeper Traugat Daga's history of the Moravian involvement with the American Revolution. Uh, he describes Moravians' early desire to be seen as neutral in what was effectively a, a violent civil war in, in America, uh, the American Revolution, uh, their, their, their uncertainty, their helplessness, their desperation during this time uh, as the violent conflict swirled around them. But uh, Baga, in his retrospective of the Moravian turmoil during these years, written uh, some years after the end of the war, um, described a turning point in the Moravians' involvement in the revolution when they found themselves without political support in the revolutionary state government of North Carolina, which caused them to make the crucial decision to become involved in politics and accept citizenship in the revolutionary state. And he concludes that learning how to pull the levers of power for themselves was part of the process of becoming American. Uh, Larry Tice, uh, explores the ways in which Wachovia uh, absorbed, uh, reflected, attempted to deflect uh, challenges to their religious ethos, to their influence within their own region. He reminds us that Wachovia was very much a local settlement in a specific place in North Carolina, but at the same time, the Arabian community was an international religious community that interacted with such luminaries as John Wesley, George Whitfield, George Washington, and Benjamin Franklin. Uh, and he, he uh, brings, brings out the aggressive spread of the Methodist movement throughout the early Republic and in the Wachovia and Central North Carolina region itself that spread the Methodist movement uh, that threatened the Moravians. Um, the famous itinerant preacher Lorenzo Dow preached just on the outskirts of Wachovia, uh, held staged emotional camp meetings nearby that proved very alluring, particularly for younger generations of Moravians, some of whom began defecting to the Methodists. The, so the, the allure of the emotional appeal of, of Methodism proved too hard to resist. And so therefore, this complicated the Moravians' relationships with friends and the outsiders, the strangers with, with, around whom and with whom they, they lived. Uh, Riddick Weber explores the, the evolution of the, single, the Salem Single Sisters Choir. By the late 18th century, some sisters began chafing under choir and community regulations. Communal life seemed to them an intrusion on their individual selfhood. They began demanding the autonomy to choose their own marriage partners. And though many single women continued to live in the choir, the sisters became, as he sees it, less a voluntary association of young and unmarried women banding together for mutual support. All of this points toward the Unity Synod of 1818 within the Moravian Church, more broadly construed, the, the international unity. Uh, that synod allowed single members to choose their own spouses and concessions that historians have recognized as a crucial milestone on the road to Americanization. And so the question I would ask of this group is, did Americanization involve a conscious rejection 
of that which made the Moravians distinctive in Zinzendorf's and Spangenberg's original vision, or did it involve tailoring that vision to new realities? In other words, did they still think of themselves as distinctively Moravian, even as they became American? And if so, how? Session three was called Moravians and Their Neighbors, African-American and American Indian Relationships. Uh, Martha Hartley provides an overview of African-American um, settlers population uh, in, in early Wachovia. She describes the necessity of labor in the building of the Moravian settlement turned to enslaved labor, uh, but the fear that slavery would corrupt white brothers and sisters, and so regulations were designed to limit slavery in Salem itself. Still, enslaved people were found in trades, craft, agriculture, domestic service throughout the settlement, making this an unusual African-German settlement in early America. By the 1820s and 1830s, growing pressures from private citizens to relax the regulations reflected growing privatization with the result that by the 1840s, these restrictions were lifted totally and on the eve of the Civil War, as Martha's ongoing work with the Hidden Town Project is revealing, um, there, there, were, there were at least 160 identified people of African descent within, within the town of Salem, making it a substantial, substantially large urban African-American population. Rowena McClinton explores the Moravian mission among the Cherokees of Spring Place, Georgia. Uh, the pressure on the Cherokees to Americanize by accepting Christianity capitalism, English language, uh, represented a kind of cultural fusion uh, that Christianity was absorbed by at least some Cherokees alongside indigenous beliefs, which survived and endured along with or beneath or within uh, Christian forms of worship. Uh, some Cherokees became slaveholders and plantation owners, representing their cultural assimilation into what they perceived as a growing mainstream of American capitalist um, and, and cultural ways. Um, they adopted their own constitution based on the US Constitution. In some ways, they Americanized too successfully to the extent that they represented now a threat to white Americans, with the result that uh, their attempt to Americanize and to assimilate did not save them from being forced into the trail of tears, as we saw so memorably uh, and in the, uh, the film on, on, on Wednesday night. Uh, Andre Minkins uh, followed up on his play that he premiered on Wednesday, uh, Searching for Wachovia. Uh, he discussed how Moravian, the Moravian Congregational Order provided uh, openings for skilled craftsmen, such as the enslaved potter Peter Oliver, to advance and gain his freedom. And yet the record also shows a resistance against the Moravians, particularly during the Revolutionary period. And so um, Minkins explores how the, 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 the record of the, of the Moravians uh, points in a number of different directions to, uh, toward uh, assimilation and self-assimilation of people of African descent and enslaved people, but also a breaking away uh, from that, that order, that integrated racial order, a breaking away both by white Moravians, as well as African Americans who attempted to establish their own sacred space within the new congregation established in 1822. Uh, Charles Rodenbaugh um, discusses an episode in 1775 when a planter uh, named Francis uh, Fernley or Farley uh, moved from Antigua to a plantation in North Carolina, or rather in, in Southern Virginia, about 50 miles away from, uh, from Wachovia. And he brought with him uh, 100 enslaved Africans from Antigua, uh, some of whom were already quite familiar with the Moravians uh, from the Moravian mission in Antigua, which had been started some years earlier. Yet the Moravians did not, curiously, attempt to extend their connection to this Afro-Moravian population. They did not reach out from Salem to try to extend that, 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 that connection that had been previously established in Antigua. And Rodenbaugh asked why that was. He doesn't offer any conclusive uh, uh, ideas about that, but he suggests that perhaps that, that reflected a, a sense that the Moravians were, on the one hand, too, um, so absorbed with, 
with uh, maintaining their own equilibrium during this very fraught period of the American Revolution that perhaps that separated them from any kind of meaningful way to, to, to reach out. It's, it's, a, it's a fascinating question, a fascinating episode, and, uh, and Rodenbaugh's research is unveiling this, but it but also raises a lot of questions. We'd like to know uh, what happens. Um, um, and then finally, within this session, Ulrika Wiethaus uh, discusses the Spring Lace mission as a site of Cherokee slaveholding and a two-tiered Moravian mission system there, the primary mission system for Cherokees, the lesser one for Afri enslaved African Americans. Uh, she uses this to invoke uh, a broader theoretical discussion based on ideas from the political theorist James Scott, who conceptualized the idea of the weapons of the weak uh, and, and what he called um, hid, tr hidden transcripts uh, to describe the way subordinate groups like enslaved and indigenous people resist power by withholding their consent to be ruled. Their hidden transcripts of resistance, often unrecorded in conventional documents, uh, raise the question of who writes the stories that get presented as history, and they force us to consider the power relations inherent in the writing of history. How do we as, how do we as historians transcend the silences created by the very act of archival production? So my question for this group is, what does the phrase becoming American look like from African American and Native American perspectives? Insofar as we can hear their voices in the record, what do they tell us about what the idea of America and becoming American meant to them? The final session, session four, uh, new insights from the Moravian archives. Uh, in, in this session, Eric Elliott, archivist of the Moravian church in, in Old Salem, um, described recent events by the Moravian archives in Winston-Salem to create databases of the names of enslaved people in the Wachovia tract for use in historical and genealogical uh, research. This effort has involved a number of people uh, exploring a number of different kinds of sources. The idea is to create a, a large database that could then uh, reveal the extent of the African-American presence in, in early Wachovia um, and, and it could be used then to, to trace and already has been used in some ways to establish genealogical links uh, to, to modern generations. And, uh, and, and uh, Elliot reminds us of the importance of names, of naming names in the age of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, where it's important to establish uh, the, the sense of, of their personhood and not, not, just, not just simply as another statistic of American violence. Uh, Tom McCullough asks, uh, when did Moravians in America develop a sense of belonging in the US? He investigates the increased participation in secular civic celebrations after the revolution, like July 4th, uh, the embrace of national history, the identification with revolutionary healer, heroes like George Washington and the Marquis de Lafayette, uh, particularly among younger Moravian generations, uh, they identify with national consciousness increasingly uh, by the War of 1812, and this rise in national consciousness, he argues, spiked by 1826, coinciding with the 50th anniversary of the Declaration, and so therefore he argues that this increasing um, identification with American civic culture is, is another index of Americanization among the Moravians. And finally, Paul Poiker, archivist uh, in, in, uh, in, in Bethlehem, Moravian archivist in Bethlehem, um, describes how 18th century Moravian archivists manipulated the archival footprint of the church by censoring and destroying sensitive material they thought made the Moravians, particularly during the Zinzendorf era, look too radical, too strange, too out there. There's a dialectic between what Poiker calls archivalization the conscious or unconscious choice to put something in an archive, and Moravian society itself. They produce and change each other. Moravian society and Moravian record keeping in the archive produce and change each other. This raises broader questions of how historical knowledge itself is created and transmitted. Um, broadly, broadly speaking, um, my, my, my sense of having 
having worked in Moravian archives now for 30 years and more, in, in Herodot, in Salem, in Bethlehem, um, it is that while, while we, can, we can talk about archival silences and distortions and manipulations, of course, that's generic to any archive. But there's something fascinating about Moravian archives. Yes, they're full of silences, but when I go into an archive and I start looking at Moravian records, I find them raucous places. They're boisterous. They're, they're full of people shouting at me from the 18th century, uh, yelling at me, you know, look at this, listen to this, listen to these voices. Look at, here are the ones who aren't here, but here are the ones who are and who are telling us stuff. And it's up to us to find out and to interpret what they're telling us. And, and I love that. I, 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 I feel that it's incumbent on us not to be thrown obstacles by the sciences, but to find ways to try to transcend them. And that, that to me is what the unique challenge of this, of this, um, of the Moravian Archive Project is. And so therefore, I would ask this group, where does archival, archivalization meet Americanization in the Moravian Archive? Where does archivalization and meet Americanization in Moravia? The conscious choice to create and curate an archive, how does that help us understand the way Moravian archivists in the 18th and 19th century saw, perceived, and manipulated the changes that were going around them toward Americanization? And that, my friends, is all I have to say. <laughs> and so thank you for your patience. And I pose these, these questions to you and, and invite your reflection and your discussion. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, John. That was uh, an amazing task that we had given you. And you did a wonderful job summarizing not only the theme, uh, but also the, uh, the papers and uh, presented some really good questions for the groups to think about. We have invited four representatives from each of these groups, and I would now like to give each representative an opportunity to respond to the questions that uh, John asked. And we will probably just go in order of uh, the sessions. And so we'll start with uh, session one on art and the representative for that is uh, David Bergstone. So David, would you want to go ahead and um, uh, try to offer an answer. Well, we, we can talk about this for a long time. Um, I have some initial thoughts though, just, you know, in John's questions about, you know, is this, I think a conscious decision, some of these changes we're seeing as we're looking at the cultural aspects of it. Um, I, I, I have to think that is an issue that, even though we talk about this being the back country and the Moravians were isolated here, they came from a much broader worldview and were traveling all over and had all this, you know, they were reading contemporary newspapers about the Hundred Year War and discussing that in the boys' school. So we know, even though they were this little group, they were trying to isolate themselves, they still had a much, I think, broader view of what else was happening around them internationally, not just simply their, you know, immediate neighbors. So I think there's a, maybe a slightly different viewpoint that they may have had than you might have found, you know, further down the road. Although sort of struck me as I was thinking about that, you know, we talk about their neighbors also being the English and the Irish, Scotch Irish, and you know, other German communities nearby in Guilford County, even. Um, that the organization, you know, is at that time period is also largely religious, which I think is another interesting component to discussing how they were self-aware because they were basically organizing themselves largely by religion at that point. And that's something I think we have a harder time thinking how their viewpoint of, you know, what they were was, was a nationality as much as it was what the religious, you know, association was. I think that's a, maybe something that impacts on this as we talk about how the music is adopted or changed and how they're using that and, you know, that they're organized by religion. So I think there's, you know, there's all these, you know, it's, it's obviously more complex um, to discuss. Um, another thing that struck me too, you know, we know they had local libraries and there's attempts throughout to, share that and have, you know, discussions with um, within the community about these other sources. Um, and the town was also very distinctive, I think, in terms of not being as insular 
that it didn't attract people for other reasons, economic reasons, as people came to town to buy trade goods or to have a bank to deal with money, cultural issues. They're coming here to hear the music or to, um, for an education. And, you know, we see that it has sustained itself through, through generations, even to the present. I mean, it's still pointed out, Wake Forest. You know, why is it here? Why did Reynolds come here? Mm -hmm. School of the Arts, first arts council in the country is all here in Winston-Salem because of largely that Moravian attitude towards culture. So I think there's, you know, strong connections throughout that even talk about the insular nature of Salem, you know, there was a much broader worldview, I think, going on and, and their connections that we see through through all the, you know, on our session, especially the culture and architecture. Does that address some of John's questions for us? That's great. Uh, is there anyone else from session one who would like to uh, offer an, any additional comments to uh, David's? If not, and we can come back to this, I'd like to uh, ask the representative from the second group, um, Craig Atwood, to see if he could uh, respond to John's question. And before responding, Craig, would you mind repeating John's question? I uh, should have written John's question down. Uh, sorry. <laughs> Good job. Perhaps John could repeat it. Yeah, John, could you, would you mind repeating the question one more time for us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay, here, let me, let me uh, summon it back up. Okay. Um, did, uh, <clears throat> okay, did Americanization involve a conscious rejection of that which made the Moravians distinctive in Zinzendorf's and Spangenberg's original vision or did it involve tailoring that vision to new realities? In other words, did they still think of themselves as distinctively Moravian, even as they became American? Yes, it's an excellent question. And um, I, I often tease that when you ask a Moravian a yes or no question, they generally <laughs> say both yes, uh, yes and no. Uh, what we do see in this period that, you know, the conference is studying this Americanization process, the Moravians internally were in Europe and America were turning away from some of the most distinctive features of the Zinzendorf vision. And that's where I find the figure of Spangenberg to be such a, a pivotal figure because he was truly a radical pietist who built you know, religious communes in North Carolina, Pennsylvania. But when you read his Adea Fidea Fratrum, you only get the barest echoes of Zinzendorf and the, the original vision. Uh, when we're looking at the Americanization process itself, Moravians continued uh, to have a dual identity and do to this day, uh, most Moravians. Um, I think your comment upon what, what do we mean by being American uh, is, is really one we should have looked at a little more carefully in the conference um, because Moravians today still maintain a worldwide unity in which 85-90% uh, of uh, Moravians are people of color. Uh, this frequently con uh, is in conflict with certain American values that are still prevalent today. And you can see the church um, continues to struggle with what does it mean to be Moravian and what does it mean to be American. Uh, for years, uh, just to be um, uh, provocative and a little glib, I have described that the, the process of Moravians becoming American is seen best in the growth of uh, being more sexist, uh, more racist, more capitalist, uh, more in individualist. Um, and I think we can trace that throughout the 19th century uh, and so when, you know, R.J. Reynolds built his tobacco company in Winston, it was a different kind of Moravian community than we see in 1800. Mm -hmm. And I think several of the papers have, have pointed to that. So those are my initial thoughts on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Craig. I thought that was excellent. Um, Okay, let's uh, move to the, the third question. And John, I don't know if you would uh, 
do mm -hmm. Andre Minkins the favor of repeating your, your third yes. Que question. Yes. Okay. Um, um, my question was, what does the phrase becoming American look like from African American and Native American perspectives? Insofar as we can hear their voices in the record, what do they tell us about what the idea of America meant to them? Um, Andre, it looks like your, your microphone is muted here. Let me. All right, there you go. All right, thank you. Uh, forget that every time. Uh, <laughs> but the, uh, the, the records, uh, first of all, seem to indicate that in describing how African-Americans um, were, were viewed and, and pictured uh, via the writings, uh, you can see uh, both rebellion and acceptance. Um, those that accepted, uh, even after running away once or twice, those who, who accepted eventually became uh, what was considered model citizens and, and were able to be uh, representatives of the Moravian uh, faith and church um, for the, for the uh, enslaved Africans overall. And then, but you had those who were immediately sold or sold as soon as possible if they could not reconcile um, what the Moravians seemed to be, uh, deemed to be uh, acceptable behavior. Um, and then you could see also on the uh, on the Cherokee end that there was a, uh, a, a a real need to 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 want to help the generations coming up behind uh, behind them by allowing them to be quote civilized with uh, with uh, learning how to uh, to to go to school and to to learn those things that were deemed um, European uh, taking on. A lot of the the, the uh, personalities of the European dress of the Europeans, and uh, to see that that ultimately caused their demise because of of um, seeming uh, seemingly, as you mentioned, John, being too uh, you know, like a threat that uh, that their constitution and that their resolve um, may turn into something else. And plus, the, the Georgians wanted the land on, on when, it, when it came to the, on the Georgian side. Um, mm -hmm. So there was this fear uh, also of having seen some of the Native Americans uh, turn on settlers um, at, the, um, at the nudging of the French and the, and the British trying to, uh, to uh, take over and um, uh, stop these, uh, these usurpers um, who are, you know, trying to uh, form their own country. Um, and so in the middle of all of this, Cherokee also intertwined with the, uh, with the enslaved Africans by becoming slave, over, uh, slave owners themselves and live in a duality where they did have slaves uh, and aside from, from Van being one of the uh, harshest slave owners, uh, others would work alongside their slaves. Um, and not that there was a, you know, I mean, that says something, but the, the enslaved Africans who were, who were, you know, free because of spirituality, maybe, still was not free as a human being. And the contradictions, you know, were there and, um, and were huge contradictions. And, and watching um, how someone who will call on uh, the blood of Christ to be, you know, the sole uh, release of sin and, and, um, and have someone uh, live a, a life that is... Uh, Full of peace and joy, uh, watching and listening to that, but uh, but not living that peace and that joy, um, could you know really uh, create a, a a dichotomy that allows for some enslaved Africans to be uh, totally resistant and others to to give in. So um, the church is also an indication, um, based on uh, what we heard yesterday from uh, Martha, that there were records or or people that we discover underneath the church and, uh, mm -hmm. and, and the stories that still have yet to be told but the fact that we are working hard and the work is being done to preserve some of those, uh, at least um, uh, maybe not individual stories, but stories of the people in, in large. Thank you, Andre. That's great. Mm -hmm.
Um, okay, so we'll move on to the fourth representative, Paul Poiker. And again, John, if you would be so kind to repeat your question. I can indeed. Okay. Uh, well, I, off of, of the phrase that, that Paul introduces us to archivalization, namely the um, let me, uh, <laughs> archivalization, the conscious or unconscious choice to put something in an archive. Uh, where does archivalization meet Americanization in the Moravian archive? In other words, uh, how, how, did, how did Moravian archivists and their record keeping uh, reflect or shape the process of Americanization if that's what was going on in the 18th and 19th centuries? And how, did, how do we see that in, 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 in the record? And this, this, this dichotomy that, that Paul described between Moravian society and Moravian record keeping about that society shaped each other. How do we see that in the context of Americanization? Right. Um, well, I think um, we might want to take the, uh, the concept of archives a little wider and include the collections of objects that were created in the 19th century. Uh, the museums, the uh, young men's missionary societies, both in Salem and in Bethlehem, starting to collect objects that were relevant, thought relevant to the history. Um, for example, here in Bethlehem, they preserved the Pulaski banner that was made for General Pulaski, and um, photographs were made of, of women recreating that banner wearing Moravian garb, and I think that's a very tangible connection between the revolution and, and, and Moravian history intentionally created. Um, the organ from the Brethren's House made by Tannenberg was preserved. And the story that you hear when you see the organ is always that General Washington heard the organ play. So the objects are, are preserved and also linked with an American uh, identity. Um, the uh, in, 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 in collecting materials, uh, books, um, for example, um, Moravians began to collect a lot of books from the ancient unity. Huss, the Bohemian Brethren, Comenius. Um, during the 19th century, that aspect of Moravian history became much more important in an intentional reorientation of the church away from the German link to an older history that was not part of the German identity of the church, but transcended that and made the um, American Moravian church uh, less German, less dependent on an authority in the old world. I, I think that that also has to do with um, modernization, Americanization, um, a greater sense of um, independence from the older roots. Um, and then uh, a third aspect I see in the historiography, how Moravian archivist historians are writing about the history. Um, they begin um, to explain away certain aspects of Moravian history that they don't understand, like the choir system, uh, which was perceived as non-American, uh, the communal system, very un-American, um, to share property with one another, um, and, and people stopped understanding the theology of the Moravians, the, the devotion of the blood and wounds of Christ. Um, and, and I see all those are aspects of a changing a community and a changing interpretation of, uh, of the history. They did not throw away records, I can tell you that, in the 19th century. They did not throw away uh, records anymore, but they added and they stressed in the collection what, uh, what was thought to be important. Thank you, Paul. I think that's really interesting that in, in the process of becoming American, they actually went even back further in order to find some origination story, a, a narrative that uh, did not connect them maybe to a, a, a culture, a German culture that conflicted with uh, their concept of being American and that this older concept actually allowed them to be American and Moravian at the same time. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Uh -huh. um, yeah, yeah, Craig, please. Um, I think one thing that is really helpful is to see that this is actually happening with Moravians in Europe as well. 
Uh, it's not simply an Americanization process, but we see over the course of the 19th century, German Moravians becoming much more nationalistically German. Uh, the British um, province, which included Ireland, is wanting independence away from unity control. Um, mm -hmm. And um, and part of what I find really interesting about this post-Zinzendorf period is trying to discern how much discomfort there was with the Zinzendorfian ideal even before he died. Uh, and just, uh, uh, you know, and when you read the polemics against the Moravians, they really focus on some of the issues of this conference, which is, you know, fear of Moravian work with Native Americans, fear of uh, Moravian work among uh, enslaved people, the fear of the communes, uh, fear of the gender norms in the Moravian church. And we see that globally, not just in what will be the United States. Yeah, absolutely, Craig. And I think it's also important to recognize the 19th century as a period of, uh, of nationality or the development of national identities. Uh, there didn't, I mean, Germany didn't even exist as a nation yet until 1871. And so, um, you know, that, that idea of a, a supranational pietistic uh, group is potentially easier for a, a group when they come from a, a, a region that does not have a unified nation yet. Very good points. Uh, does anyone else from the uh, sessions want to offer an answer? And if not, then what we could do is move directly to mm -hmm. the Q&A uh, mm -hmm. portion of this the session. The answer is yes. Okay, go, <laughs> go ahead, Larry. Uh, I'd, I'd like to uh, offer a slightly different uh, response on questions and uh, uh, just just to provoke our, our thought a little bit uh, I would argue that uh, th it was in between being Moravians or, or being Americans I would I would argue that uh, that it was a question between Germans or American and uh, I, I actually think that the the Moravians in Wachovia uh, ended up being more German. Their German uh, uh, characteristic outweighed their Moravian characteristic. And uh, I would argue to support that uh, there was a transition uh, from being internationally oriented to being locally oriented. It's just a pragmatic manner. If you want to keep Wachovia land, you've got to deal with issues locally. And uh, as far as uh, Moravian liturgy uh, and church practices, uh, again, the Moravians had to become very practical and turn to preaching as a method of, of surviving uh, in, in the American environment and also uh, using the, their greatest asset uh, and from their liturgy is the sunrise service, which became the most popular attraction from the 18th century down to the present as the way in which uh, uh, other uh, denominations uh, by Moravians. Uh, and then switching from German styles in terms of architecture and good to what sells locally. Uh, and then also the, the conundrum about the Moravians uh, adopting the practice of slavery, that is, uh, that's one that just is very difficult to, to deal with uh, uh, conception uh, because of the, the history of, of Moravian uh, love of people and so on, uh, is that there limited labor supply in Wachovia, and the Moravians did exactly what other people in North Carolina did with a limited labor supply. They followed the local uh, practices of adopting slavery and uh, the house of uh, free blacks. So I would argue that uh, they were extremely Germanic and they became very practical and pragmatic of being able to live 
uh, in this area so that their German character was much stronger than their Moravian character. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you, Larry. Um, that's uh, really something we need to also go perhaps more deeply into it as we move forward. And I would like to shift now because I'm a timekeeper, very Germanic characteristic of mine to be um, very, very conscious of time. And my co-convener, Professor McAllister, is um, checking out to prepare for the next session. We decided that we will, um, bye Grant, see you soon, that we will um, go close to 11.30 for questions that come from our audience. And then I would like to remind everybody that we also can ask questions uh, after Professor Fowles' presentation. So whatever we don't get to, we can still do it towards the end of our morning together. And again, many, many thanks to John for a fantastic summary of our research and progress. For all of you who asked the question, will we, we will be able to read the papers? Absolutely. Our morning colloquia were um, part of sharing drafts of our research, creating a common platform to share ideas with each other. And we continue this cooperation and collaboration amongst all of us. It will become eventually a book is our hope and we will roll out individual papers through our Moravian Studies Collaborative until the book is being published. So stay tuned and stay in touch with us. And without further ado, I will move to our questions. So here's one that looks um, really very, very interesting. I will read it to you. Can you discuss the political process by which Wachovia became North Carolina and America? So I would like to open the floor to all my colleagues. Whoever would like to take that question, please go ahead. How did Wachovia become North Carolina and then the United States? Early on, um, you know, Wachovia is the name by which the Moravian community knows the area. Uh, politically, it was Dobbs Parish in the colonial government. And so it immediately it had to have a political overlay to exist to allow the uh, Moravians their uh, uh, decision-making independence within the, the colony. Um, uh, uh, Jake Brodeman was talking about the, the process in a paper he presented this week about uh, uh, being in the room when it happened when you were allowed to uh, perhaps have a little more independence and not join sides. Uh, and it was a conscious decision to be accessible to the conversation, uh, but to uh, remain neutral during the Revolutionary War. So um, um, that was part of our discussion this week and how that um, and again, perhaps it was a very practical decision, uh, but it was um, something that allowed the Moravians to keep their in independent identity uh, and yet still be included in the American conversion. I could add to that as well that uh, uh, the effect of the American Revolution was basically to abolish Dobbs Parish as a separate entity. and, and uh, uh, all of a sudden, Wachovia became part of Surrey County, North Carolina, and uh, it was just one of the elements of Surrey County. So the the political uh, uh, segmentation uh, uh, devolved to the county unity uh, in North Carolina. And if I could add, I think uh, part of what's important to recognize about Dobbs Parish is that it is both political and religious because it was a parish of the Church of England. There were only four parishes in colonial North Carolina, three on the coast, and then the Dobbs Parish. And this depended very much on the Moravians um, presence in England and especially the Act of Parliament in 1749. Uh, but it meant that the Moravians, uh, with their ecumenism, uh, actually had an Anglican minister in Dobbs Parish who would uh, conduct English language services. So from the very founding of Wachovia, we have this tension between wanting to have control of their own political affairs, 
but also having to adapt and work, work within the established church of the British Empire. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would like to chime in. The, um, the, count, the county seat of, of Rowan, which Wakobi was in, within Rowan County at that point it was established, in Salisbury was the, was the government center, and that's where you had to go for any court or other kind of you know, official issues. Dobbs Parish, me, was always more of a, a religious thing to help separate them so they were not, not part of the St. Luke's Parish, which was the seat of the We are losing you a little bit. Funny about that. Mm -hmm. Okay, David, thank you. We are lost, at least I lost you a little bit. So I don't know whether that's my internet connection. Can you all hear me? Can you, am I clear? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, sorry, David, that maybe some of us lost your answer. The questions are rolling in. Thank you so much to our community members. Um, okay, so let me see. Here is one from Mady Wright, <clears throat> who I think is a, a divinity school student at Wake Forest. So let me read Mady's um, question to you. I have always thought of my research on the Moravians with a dichotomy of radical versus repressed in mind. With the nationalization of Moravians in America, would you see that as a radical act of creating a unique segment of Moravians in one specific place or a repression of Moravian identity in order to fit into this new space. I would say that I have also begun to think of this as a both and relationship rather than as an either or. So the operational terms here are radical versus repressed. And I think that harks back to our question, how much Moravians had to give up part of their radicalness um, in order to fit in. And Craig already addressed that to, to a degree, but maybe somebody else would take this question. Okay, Jake, please, yeah. I was thinking about Paul's, I think this ties in with some of Paul Poiker's observations about time um there's how people are form well how people are are linking objects of american identity within their moravian identity um within within this community how people are remembering experiences and events are clearly changing at different points on the timeline and so George Washington hearing, like George Washington heard the organ, like that doesn't matter when George Washington is actually hearing it. It is only important in retrospect. It is only important once this other national and patriotic question is being overlaid. Um, when I was looking at Traga Baggy's um, historical sketch of the revolution, it's penned in 1783. It becomes archivally important, I think, because it, it, in subsequent generations, it takes on an American, it becomes an American text. It's not an American text in 1783. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, so I think that this question of, of radicalism and what does radical, what, ra what radicalism needs to be put aside, um, I think the question becomes who is putting it aside and at what point. Um, so I, I, I think that the, the Moravians are most fascinating at their at their at their archival level, and I think this this question of Americanization, I think, is a question of of when, and it's a question of memory. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Jake. Do we have other presenters who want to um, add to Jake's comments? I I wanted to say that mm -hmm. uh, what I found interesting is that. Um, there were times when there was a time when that hundred thousand uh, acre track was threatened um, by the General Assembly to be taken away from them had had they not proven to be more uh, American in their ideology away from the British, and then they had high hopes of uh, 
of not having to do as much with slavery or um, with, uh, with some of the things that became uh, a problem, like in a lot of the journals, the Negro problem and uh, issues with, uh, with trying to, to do more of the Cherokee, but because um, the, the threat of not being American enough in this area, especially in North Carolina, kept them from being as radical as they could have been. Hmm. Okay, thank you. So two um, slightly um, different answers to this, certainly a conversation that we need to continue. I would like to move on to another question. Here's one from Tom Mann. And Tom asks, how did Moravians use scripture to defend their treatment of Native Americans and slaves? So how did Moravians use scripture to defend their treatment of Native Americans and slave, slaves? Uh, I guess I can start first. Um, they didn't really have to use um, scripture from their own doctrine because the rest of the European world had already laid out mm -hmm. uh, philosophies and mm -hmm. science mm -hmm. that, um, that determined that uh, people of color were not just less human beings, but they were different species. And so there was, uh, there was already that already doctrine out there uh, in Europe before they even embarked upon this imperialism uh, and um, kind of colo uh, colonialization of the world. So all they had to do was, you know, they resisted for a while, but all they had to do was tap into what was already out there and it per permeated every discipline. Um, so it was already there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the, the cursed children of Ham theory is mm -hmm. what they used. Uh, a lot of that and uh, biology uh, was, um, was invented through uh, this whole uh, survival of the fittest um, uh, ideology. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Andre. And that was a point you made very eloquently in your play on Wednesday night. Yeah. So thank you. Uh, Craig, I would like to call on you because you're a theologian and uh, would you like to build on Andre's comment? Uh, yes, the, um, uh, one of the problems with uh, scripture and especially for um, Protestant groups that claim to base their doctrine on scripture is that both the Old and New Testaments of the Christian canon have statements that are supportive of slavery as a state of affairs from the ancient world. Uh, and Moravians often took those statements at face value, as did most Christian uh, groups. Uh, Catherine Gerbner uh, did a great book recently arguing that white supremacy has its roots in Christian supremacy. Uh, but uh, when we look at the writings of Paul, for instance, Paul, uh, one of the letters in the canon is Paul returning an escaped slave. And that was used to support the Fugitive Eight, uh, Slave Act in America. Um, there are statements about slaves obey your masters. Um, with the Moravians, um, this was combined with uh, what I see in Moravian theology, especially after Zinzendorf, an increasing emphasis on obedience as the greatest Christian value. And I know this is hard uh, it sounds hard in my ears. It's hard for us to understand. Moravians viewed themselves as slaves to Christ. And I think they had mm -hmm. difficulty recognizing that chattel slavery is an entirely different thing than the mm -hmm. slavery in the Bible, uh, than the metaphorical being a slave to Christ, et cetera. And I think what And Andre was talking about illustrates how that comes up, that enslaved Moravians were indeed treated quite differently than uh, free white Moravians. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, it was the Quakers who were the first Christian group to really embrace um, abolition and emancipation. And it's in part because they were not as bound to scripture as their authority as other Protestant groups, mm -hmm. that the living Christ um, I really would love to see some research on uh, the relationship of Anthony Benizet, uh, the great Quaker abolitionist, early mm -hmm. abolitionist, 
and mm -hmm. the Moravians in Pennsylvania, Christopher mm -hmm. Perlaeus and some others. But mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mark Knoll argues that the debate over slavery was had a profound impact on American Christianity in general, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. you can't just simply say, the Bible says it, I believe it, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. when you confront such an, uh, an egregious moral evil in the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so um, if, if I may, um, we, our um, keynote from last night, Dr. Curtin Roberts, would add to Craig and Andrew, and after that, Geoff, please. Vinel, can you be with us? Can you unmute? Okay, I don't see, I don't see that happen. So, Geoff, the floor is yours. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I think John and Martha could also speak to this, but in terms of the acceptance of slavery in Wachovia, um, the first purchase of an enslaved person, they actually turned to the lot too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I guess I would, I would add to this is that what I find fascinating is that um, the Moravians lived and interpreted themselves within the threshold, the crevice between what would seem to be contradictory biblical teachings. On the one hand, mm -hmm. and, and Craig both point out that, yes, there, there's a long tradition here for pro-slavery thought, and that had, had been long in play, long before the Moravians ever came into being. Um, and, and so, yes, they, they followed that, they adopted that. You know, but on the other hand, they're saying there's, there's, there's neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free, which they interpreted to mean that Christ's word of redemption and martyrdom is open to everybody. And so how do you, how do, you do that? How do you mm -hmm. accept enslaved people into your mm -hmm. community um, as enslaved people, but also mm -hmm. as enslaved mm -hmm. brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. they, this, these are the contradictions they tried to work mm -hmm. out. And, mm -hmm. and as mm -hmm. we see, this could have, this could have gone anywhere. It could have gone mm -hmm. in a mm -hmm. more radical, anti-slavery direction, mm -hmm. but it also could have gone to more pro-slavery, pro-seg direction, which is what we know ended up mm -hmm. happening. Mm. And as I wrote uh, in my paper, you know, Frederick Douglass made that very clear. You know, he, he distinguished between a Christianity of the land, which is really the Christianity of brutal um, brutality and enslavement, and the Christianity of Christ, which is a Christianity of liberation, abolition, and freedom. And um, with that, unfortunately, I have to close out our session. But as you can see, our conference is one step in a long, long, long conversation. This is my vision of a university without borders. We are actively, and I hope respectfully, engaging with our community. We are trying to heal the past, to move forward, and leave an academy for the young generations to come after us, in which we show respect to all. So with that, with that word from my heart, I um, end this session. Those of you who have questions for all of us who are working very hard on being responsible academics, uh, please send your questions to our registrar and um, Victoria Lang will make sure to pass it on to all of us. So thank you so much. Join us to our concluding keynote. So glad you're with us and see you in a few minutes. Auf Wiedersehen. Thanks.